Hello, welcome to the Theology Podcast. It's great to have you with us. Say, last episode, we said it would be, we would at, we'd be together again before we actually did another virtual show. We, or at least I, had uh, lost track of time and uh, thought that we were at the last virtual show before the big Pacific Northwest tour. And then Glenn corrected me. Glenn said, no, we've got one more show to go before we're together. And so this is the last virtual show that we're going to have for a little while because we're going to be recording a number of shows while we're together up here in the Pacific Northwest. I think I think we're going to have at least six shows that we're going to record before live audiences and uh, in each other's presence, and that's going to be great. But anyway, if this is your first time with us uh, on the Theology Podcast, you may be saying to yourself, I seem to have come in in the middle of the movie. What's going on? Who are these people? So let's spend a, just a quick uh, couple of moments uh, uh, introducing ourselves. I'm C.R. Wiley. I'm a pastor. I serve a church here in the Pacific Northwest, and um, I've written some books. Uh, one of those books is The Household of the War for the Cosmos, and I have a book coming out on Tom Bombadil. And uh, I'm really glad to, uh, you know, see that that's uh, finally uh, just about to be available for folks. But that's enough about me. How about you, Tom? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, Tom Price. I teach systematic theology, uh, Christian ethics, uh, Christian, well, philosophy as well. Um, currently white, writing a book uh, engaging uh, Christian theology, ethics, and technology. And so that's that's very exciting, actually, to be doing that work. And it will be more exciting to have it complete. So that's my <laughs> aim here shortly. <laughs> <laughs> radio, radio. All right, Glenn. I'm Glenn Sunshine. I am a retired history professor from Central Connecticut State University, senior fellow at the Colson Center for Christian Worldview, and a ministry associate for Reflections Ministries. And I've published a couple of things, too. All right. Well, we're excited uh, to talk about the subject that we're going to be addressing today. And it's your day, Glenn. <clears throat> so why don't you get us, uh, you know, get us going here? Okay, well, just by way of introduction, uh, I am in the middle of moving. <laughs> and if the green screen weren't up behind us, you would see solid evidence of that. Um, so I haven't really had a whole lot of time to, um, uh, to work up topics, but it turns out a couple of weeks ago, I was at a conference, I'm speaking at a conference uh, in Scranton, Pennsylvania, uh, called uh, The Good Worth Fighting For, uh, subtitle something to the effect of what Tolkien's Middle Earth can teach us about reality. And so I thought I'd pick up on some of the things I talked about there, and uh, we could uh, see where they go. Um, the first talk I gave was dealing with some of the themes in Tolkien's essay on fairy stories. Now, we did a show a year or two ago, I don't remember exactly when, on, on fairy stories. But I find that, as is usual with Tolkien, the essay is so rich, there is so much there, that we could do a whole lot of other shows on it. So uh, what I'd like to do here, at least to start off, is pick up on one idea that he's got in it. I'm going to read you a section of it. Now, to set this in context, Tolkien talks about fairy stories having three things that they do for us. There, there are three areas where they have particular value. The first of them is uh, recovery, um, which we may talk about more later. But that's basically the idea that um, a lot of the things that exist in fairy stories are things from the mundane world. But because they're placed in this context of fairy, which he defines sort of loosely and non-technically as anything magical, um, because they're placed in that context, we can see them for what they are in a, in a way that we sort of lose sight of. He says, you know, in normal life, just sort of the average things that we see every day, trees and rocks and bread and wine and such, uh, we start taking them for granted. Um, but through including them in the fairy story, 
it reminds us of what the real significance is. And so that's recovery. The second yeah. is escape. Oh, sit. go ahead, Chris. Yeah, this reminds me of actually something I was uh, just reading this morning in Augusta, and I'm, re- I'm working my way through City of God. I think I'm in book 10. And Augusta makes this very point concerning uh, the created world that surrounds us. He says, as an effect, that uh, it's a greater miracle than any miracle that cr- that, that that you know is witnessed, <laughs> you know, by the by by Israel or the disciples. I mean, the, the very reality that we find ourselves in is a miracle, and we lose sight of that just because familiarity. This is not. The term yeah. that's for the, the expression he uses, but it gets the idea across. Familiarity breeds contempt. We just take it for granted, but it's a miracle. Mm-hmm. It's the greatest miracle of all. Yeah, I'd like to return to that one later, assuming we have time, because I think that there's a lot to unpack there. Mm-hmm. Um, the second area he mentions is escape. And this is the one that I think in a lot of ways he really takes aim at because people accused him of writing escapist literature. And we'll we'll pick up on that particular point as we go forward, uh, as we start up. Uh, The third area, though, is consolation, uh, which is the happy ending. And this is connected with this concept of eucatastrophe and things like that. Again, worth talking about more. But let's let's zero in a little bit on this escape area. Um, he, He makes the point that you know, when a critic says something is escapist, it's it, it it's a negative term. He says, now this is rather odd because escape in the real world is usually a positive thing. You know, who can blame a prisoner for trying to escape? Um, he says, uh, and this is a quote, in what the misusers are fond of calling real life, Escape is evidently, as a rule, very practical and may even be heroic. In real life, it is difficult to blame it unless it fails. In criticism, it would seem to be the worse, the better it succeeds. Uh, Just a pause there. I I love the turnaround he uses there, that if if literature succeeds in being escapist, critics dislike it. In real life... You don't blame somebody for escaping unless it fails. So he's got an interesting little turnaround there. Evidently, we are faced by a misuse of words and also by a confusion of thought. Why should a man be scorned if finding himself in prison, he tries to get out and go home? Or if, when he cannot do so, he thinks and talks about other topics than jailers and prison walls? The world outside has not become less real because the prisoner cannot see it. In using escape in this way, the critics have chosen the wrong word. And what is more, they are confusing, not always by sincere error, the escape of the prisoner with the flight of the deserter. Hmm. So through here, what he's saying basically is there's nothing wrong with escapist literature. It actually, you know, when you compare, when you think about the word escape in the real world, there's nothing negative about it, again, unless it fails. Um, and if you're thinking about somebody in prison, if he's, his mind is occupied with things other than prison, that's not a bad thing. We would see that as a positive. But somehow, this idea of escape in literature is seen as, as bad. Yeah, kind of in the background here, we've got uh, a kind of literary movement, realism, which, uh, you know, kind of focuses in on the on the dour and depressing, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, if, if you think about, you know, what you see uh, with the modernists or the, or the, the, the writers who were getting all of the attention at the time that Tolkien was writing, you know, people like Hemingway and so forth, there, there's, there's kind of a, a delight and almost sort of like uh, skewering our hopes or, or trying to show them as being baseless or, you know, inevitably uh, will be disappointed. So, you know, the better, you know, according to the, the leading critics of that time, the better the literature, the, the kind of the more depressing it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, th- I think you get 
I mean, you could see why a lot of criticisms would, you know, from contemporary literature wouldn't like it. It doesn't give anything to attack in terms of all the things they love to attack, right? <laughs> when you're when you're hoping for and looking for something uh, transcendent or anything else, it's it 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 can the only way they can attack it if they can bring it down to some kind of um, distorted vision of the here and now that it, it would um, be implicated in. But I think it's interesting when we look at kind of just the notion of fantasy literature itself, for example, or the notion of fantasy, I mean, you, you, you kind of pull that term back to its Greek origins and the, the same word we get phenomena from, which would be, you know, to the visible world that we, we kind of, that appears to us is the say it comes out of the same root that we get the word um, fantasy from phantasine, which means sort of to make visible with our perception or imagination. And so, so reality, the phenomena um, in this understanding and, and fantasy are very closely related. Um, and actually you keep pushing it back to where both of those terms come. It's the, the word we ha- uh, get, the, get the word light from. So it's illuminative the way in which both um, phenomena appear to us and also fantasy in the way in which our intel, our imagination plays into that appearance. And I think he's picking up very much in this. This is actually um, Verlin Flieger's uh, argument that uh, Tolkien is very much picking up on this connection. You know, he's a guy who knew language and he knew roots, and, and he, he has, therefore, a much richer kind of realism, if you will, than that would include elements that people otherwise would call escape because they they're the place in which imagination and and the invisible um are brought into the the mundane yeah he actually makes the argument part part of what he does is he defines words as he goes forward in this um and he uses some classical definitions imagination is the mental faculty of creating images okay um, but he goes on to talk about, he says, he, the word is difficult to come up with, but he picks fantasy as his word, which is the inclusion of things that do not exist in the primary world. He's very careful to distinguish primary and secondary worlds. Things that do not exist in the primary world into your story. Okay, so dragons, centaurs, uh, fill in the blank, all of those kinds of things, which are an essential element of fairy. And in fact, I think he would prefer, he says, fairy deals with the magical, but then he backs away from that because he defines magic in a very specific way. Uh, What it really boils down to is fairy deals with the fantastic, you know, with, with, with fantasy. And he argues that fantasy is actually the highest level of sub creation. Only God is a creator. We're sub creators. Fantasy, he argues, a successful fantasy is actually the highest level of creation rather, or sub-creation, rather than being this sort of uh, low-grade pulp genre literature. Yeah, know, I think just that he, that because he, it requires a deeper imagination. Yeah, and I think he would say that it, it, it uh, is more difficult to pull off successfully. So if I'm just, you know... Um, telling a story that's, you know, historical in character, um, you know, it can be well done or not. Obviously it can actually be inaccurate. And if I'm putting things into the story that are not historically, you know, sort of, uh, legitimate or, or actually belong in, in, in a, in a particular time period. Uh, but you know, the, the point of reference, uh, is something yeah, outside in the real world. And, so there's a kind of a, uh, a scent that the reader gives because the reader knows, okay, this is about the world that I live in. And so they can imagine, you know, it, they, they just basically sort of take the, the world of their own experience and then sort of, you know, put the story in it. Whereas with fantasy, you, you're trying to take people out of, you know, sort of the mundane, the world, you know, the mundus, you know, uh, you know, the world as they've known it into a, a whole sort of you know, world in it sort of itself, which is, um, I think in part explains why, uh, Tolkien was so, um, you know, sort of 
wrapped up in the legendarium, you know, sort of providing the background, the languages, all these different things to sort of fill out that world and make, make it as real as possible. But a lot of fantasy writers, of course, aspire to do what Tolkien did and fall very short at almost every level. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. and I, I think that that's connected to, I mean, Tolkien's theological category of sub creator. And I, and I think that that's, that's a big difference. Um, the same work I was, I was uh, mentioning Fairland Flieger's work, Splintered Light. It, um, it talks about that sub, you know, how he understood uh, sub creation um, and one of the things, the interesting connection he makes with those same two words we were talking about earlier, the way in which um, and, uh, fantasy and phenomena kind of go back to this, in, you know, Indo-European root um, of light, um, so does phenom and sound and word and utterance. And so, and, and so he kind of develops out in conversation with Owen Barfield, who um, um, many people will kind of know. Um, from that, those circles, as well as with Tolkien, the way in which sub-creator was understood um, a- as the creaturely analogy, if you will, um, of our creator, but a creaturely, a creaturely um, uh, category. But it had to do with the way in which, especially in, in, the, in the task of having dominion on one end, but also the redemptive work and mission we're called to and attesting to Christ— is the the bringing of this splintered light, which was broken in the fall, back into harmony. And so they understood the use of words, meaning, and imagination in a positive rather than just the fallen sense, and in something akin to what theologians did with philosophical language. They understood it was broken in the fall, and it was repatterned towards untruth and, and false conceptions of God. But in Christ who has come to fill all things, these things are redirected back to the one who, who, um, who created them. <laughs> um, and, and therefore they, that splinter is thus brought, is re- brought into a renewal and therefore can be used in the service of redemption. And I see those things very, very analogous. Yeah. Tol- Tolkien was, um, he was, vitally concerned, it seems to me, with this notion of subcreation. Um, he doesn't discuss it expressly in um, in on fairy stories, but it is, I think it underlies everything that he says, everything that he does. So, <clears throat> for example, he doesn't talk about willing suspension of disbelief. Um, he, I mean, he mentions that phrase, but he says he really doesn't like it. Because the object is to create a world that is so complete and so compelling that things are real while you are at least mentally inhabiting it. So rather than a willing suspension of disbelief, he talks about it as being secondary belief. Hmm. You know, and when while you're in the world, you believe these things while you're in the story. When you come out of the story, you, you have primary belief. But within the story, there's secondary belief. And that's actually, I think, an important distinction. Um, the, the difference between primary and secondary worlds, creation and sub-creation and so on. These, these are sort of important ideas that underlie a lot of the work here. Um, I'd like to, though, move this forward. I'm going to jump uh, to the next paragraph from what I read before. Um, one of the things that he complains about is people saying, you know, you, you're not dealing with, with real life. Okay. And this is what he has to say here on this point. For a trifling instance, not to mention, indeed, not to parade, electric street lamps of mass produced pattern in your tail is escape in that sense. Um, in other words, you're escaping from the world that has these electric street lamps and so on. But it may, almost certainly does, proceed from a considered disgust for so typical a product of the robot age that combines elaboration and ingenuity of means with ugliness and often with inferiority of result. Now, think for a moment, this is me, think for a moment of what he has to say in The Hobbit about goblins and what they make. Okay. This is really kind of echoed in The Hobbit there, 
Okay, so continuing what he says here. These lamps may be excluded from the tale simply because they are bad lamps. And it is possible that one of the lessons to be learned from the story is the realization of this fact. But out comes the big stick. Electric lamps have come to stay, they say. Long ago, Chesterton truly remarked that as soon as he heard that anything had come to stay, he knew it would very soon be replaced, indeed regarded as pitiably obsolete and shabby. <laughs> the march of science, its tempo quickened by the needs of war, goes inexorably on, making some things obsolete and foreshadowing new developments in the utilization of electricity and advertisement. This says the same thing, only more menacingly. The electric, now this is the point I wanted to get to. The electric street lamp may indeed be ignored simply because it is so insignificant and transient. Fairy stories, at any rate, have many more permanent and fundamental things to talk about. Lightning, for example. The escapist is not so subservient to the whims of evanescent fashion as, as these opponents. He does not make things which it may be quite rational to regard as bad, his masters or his gods by worshiping them as inevitable, even inexorable. Mm -hmm. And his opponents, so easily contemptuous, have no guarantee that he will stop there. He might rouse men to pull down the street lamps. Escapism has another and even wickeder face, reaction. Okay, so that, that's the pause. Okay, so his, his point is that a lot of the things we think of as permanent, inexorable, um, unchanging, here to stay, all of that, they're really not. And as soon as you start thinking of things that way, you're in danger of them becoming obsolete. And further, most of these things from the modern world really aren't good. They're, they're not good in themselves. They're, they're ugly. They're mass-produced. They're poor at what they do. All of these kinds of things compared to the stuff in the primary world, like lightning, as opposed to an electric street lamp. Okay. Yeah, I mean, and by excluding them from the story, you're actually making a statement about them, potentially. Hmm. This, this uh, brought to my mind, as, as you were talking about it, a couple of things. One is, you know, obviously lightning. Lightning is something that, I, if I recall, comes up later, but uh, is kind of oblique because he's referring to thunder. So later on in the essay, or maybe earlier in the essay, he's talking about uh, the nature of uh, the name uh, Thor, if I remember correctly, and its uh, etymological connection to the, the word thunder and, uh, and the use of the word thunder in a kind of a, uh, you know, way that's expressing, say, anger, you know, like, you, you know, he thunders, you know, and then, and then of course, it brings us back to Thor, all of that. But uh, mm. what, what, what jumped, what leapt to mind for the first time, you know, because I've read that essay a number of times, uh, but this, the first time that, you know, that this particular thing came to mind, uh, the street light or the street lamp in uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Remember, the, 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 the lamp mm. is there in the middle of the woods. And I can't help mm. but wonder if Tolkien was, wasn't making a little jab, or I mean, uh, Lewis was, was making a little jab at Tolkien's uh, reference in on fairy stories because because I, I think on fairy stories pre predates uh, the Chronicles of Narnia, but anyway, kind of a fun thought. I don't, like I don't have any way. Of, yeah, I don't have any way of proving my point, but it's just something I ha I, I just thought about just now. <laughs> yeah, um, it, it needs to be said at the outset that Tolkien was a was a bit of a luddite. <laughs> he he really didn't like technology. Right. Now, right. I suspect for part of the reason for that was that for Tolkien, what he thought of as technology um, was factories spewing out, you know, coal-fired factories spewing out smoke. Right. You know, he thought of it in terms of desolation of the landscape. You know, Isengard was his vision of what the modern world has done. So, yeah. You know, you have to take that into account because he, you know, he lived through the late phases of the Industrial Revolution, and a lot of our environmental concerns weren't at the top of anybody's mind at that point. 
And you can, you can actually still see in Oxford and a lot of the street buildings, all of the dark, like smog rust, if you, if you will, on the buildings that can't be cleared off from a lot of those times and, and the traffic that even would go through there. So that the noisiness, the loudness of the modern world was, was a change for them. And, uh, and that would have been, uh, likewise, you know, s- smoky and nasty. <laughs> yeah. It is interesting, though, to consider the, the fact that, you know, in a way you could say Tolkien was behind the times, but in another way you could say he was ahead of the times. Because I think one of the things that appeals to people in our time is Tolkien's environmental sensibilities and uh, people, yeah. you know, who may be turned off by other things in Tolkien find that very appealing. Yeah. It, it's interesting that when you read in Genesis in the garden of Eden, uh, Adam is told to tend and protect the garden. And the problem that we get is that people emphasize one or the other. You know, you either tend the garden, meaning develop the resources without regard for the consequences, or you protect the garden and go with dark green ecology. Yeah. Right, yeah. Right. And, and, but, but there is a proper balance to be had between the two of them. Well, it's, so, it's, it's, it's kind of fun to think about the ants and the ant wives in this respect, uh, because mm-hmm. the ant wives uh, were the agriculturalists, the ones who, you know, you know, you, you can kind of pick up uh, on the ants attitude toward the ant wives in Treebeard's description of the ant wives and their and their project. You know, he, he said uh, something to the effect that with the ant wives, they didn't listen to the plants that they that they tended. They wanted them to do what they were told. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas the ants mm-hmm. would only eat the fruit that fell at their feet, they they liked the you know the wild spaces. They didn't they didn't uh, make it you know their task to control the, the the wilderness. They they wanted to protect it, but they didn't want to use it. Um, whereas with the ant wives, you have and so consequently, the ant wives and the ants they have a hard time living together. They, they have two yeah. sort of different goods that they're pursuing. Yeah, it, this uh, it reminds me to some extent of John Eldritch in Wild at Heart, who now I'm not a, a real advocate of the book in a lot of ways, but he makes some, some really interesting points, one of which is that men were created in a wilderness and women in a garden. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there's a biblical, I think, you know, uh, maybe – case to make for that you have to kind of read between the lines a bit and stuff but yeah okay sure. yeah so. interesting yeah well i think though that one of the, the one of the challenges that we have particularly for those of us who believe that we have a dominion mandate is how we interpret um you know the sort of the two pursuits you know the ants and the ant wives uh, are the ant wives uh more in keeping with the dominion mandate uh are the ants in some sense failing to do what they were supposed to do or or what we maybe i'm putting it in a bad way what we as human beings are supposed to do in other words if if our understanding of the dominion mandate is is strictly to to uh make serve you know in the sense of serving us as opposed to uh you know, caring for or ruling things in a way that's just for their own ends and their own goods, then these two things, you know, seem to be at odds with each other. Or, uh, but I think that's the big balance, you know, sort of the challenge, you know, how, are we supposed to turn the entire world into a garden? Are there no wild spaces anymore? Uh, is that the way we're to understand the dominion mandate? Yeah. And, where I would go immediately with this is away from the ants, but uh, to look at stewardship and at the steward. Um, now, this is sort of a different direction, but the steward of Gondor's big problem in Denethor was he didn't want the king to come back. That's right. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. He may not have sat upon the throne, but he put his chair right in front of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Well, let, let, let me get to one more paragraph in, in this essay, because this is the one that I found in a lot of ways personally the most intriguing. Um, uh, let, uh, okay, yeah, I'll start from, again, this just picking up where we left off. Not long ago, incredible though it may seem, I heard a clerk of Oxenford declare that he, quote, welcomed the proximity of mass production robot factories and the roar of self-obstructive mechanical traffic because it brought his university into, quote, contact with real life. By the way, I love the description of traffic gems as self-obstructive mechanical traffic. <laughs> <laughs> he may have meant that the way men were living and working in the 20th century was increasingly was increasing in barbarity at an alarming rate, and that the loud demonstration of this in the streets of Oxford might serve as a warning that it is not possible, possible to preserve for long an oasis of sanity in a desert of unreason by mere fences <laughs> without actual offensive action, practical and intellectual. <laughs> I fear he did not. <laughs> and the, uh, so, so you get here Tolkien's attitude toward the modern world. But this is where things get really interesting because now we're about to get metaphysical. <laughs> in any case, the expression real life in this context seems to fall short of academic standards. <laughs> the notion that motor cars are more alive than, say, centaurs or dragons is curious. <laughs> that they are more real than, say, horses is pathetically absurd. How real, how startlingly alive is a factory chimney compared with an elm tree, that poor <laughs> obsolete thing, the insubstantial dream of an escapist? <laughs> yeah okay yeah now now think about this the notion that motor cars are more alive than say centaurs or dragons is curious just pause there for a moment right um in what well you know unless you're dealing with my mother the car or chitty chitty bang bang motor cars are not really alive in any sense of the world word. that's right and yet they are part of real life in a way that centaurs and dragons aren't. Centaurs and dragons are alive in the secondary worlds that they inhabit. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. He's using life yeah. uh, as a as a synonym for reality, which I agree with. But I think that that would be something that would be, uh, I guess, uh, unusual among intellectuals even in his time. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, there's the old medieval debate between, I mean, not, not so much a debate as affirmation that, that, you know, there's a, there's a thin line between the living, I mean, the being in, in the imagination and in, and in the idea and the being that is actualized in, 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 you know, temporality. Right. Um, and so there is, there is an aliveness attached to, to these things, an actuality to these things, um, that, that sometimes that's why they had these debates, on, you know, like Anselm, that, you know, that idea of God must be from God because it is nothing that could have come from my reflections on things from, you know, from experienced right. reality um, and, so, and those kind of debates. But th there's that issue. And then but there, there is this aspect in which technology as fantastic as so much of it has become in terms of being able to do things. I mean, a, a plane in flight mimicking, you know, um, real things in that way, or, or the ability to do what we're doing now. Um, but you have to start to think, if you start to think it on the reality level, there is something very um, further down the being chain, if you will, <laughs> Um, the reality chain that the technology is and it is, but it's being related to it is if it's almost on the same level of the, rea the real things. Um, and I think that's something he's trying to get at. And I, you know, the language is hard to capture, but I think he's on to something. Yeah. I think he's getting at something metaphysical as Glenn says, uh, something that cannot be simulated with artificial intelligence, something because artificial intelligence is just that it's artificial. It's not real 
and living in the sense that we're talking about here. But not even Chitty Chitty Bang Bang is artificial intelligence. Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, if you remember from the from the film, is a kind of almost magical thing. It's not it's not a mechanical mm-hmm. thing. It's a mechanical thing that has a magical sort of uh, aspect, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, and um, by the way, it wasn't just the film. It was a story written by Ian Fleming. Hmm. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I don't know that's if right. You, the same guy I behind don't know the, if you knew that about Chitty Chitty Bang. James Bond. I, yeah, yeah, the same <laughs> guy who wrote the James Bond stories. Right, right. That's yeah, great. You, you, you sort of wonder what Q would have done with it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, the, the, the next sentence, I think, is, is um, even more interesting on a metaphysical level, where he says that motor cars are more real than, say, horses is pathetically absurd. That, I think, again, is hitting at, at, a, at the key point, the difference between creation and subcreation. Mm-hmm. A horse is part of the primary creation by God himself. You know, bara, this word that is only used in Hebrew of God, meaning God is the only one who creates. God created horses. Humans subcreated motor cars. So the motor car exists, yes, in the primary world, but it isn't primary in the same sense that a horse is. I think that's what he's getting at. Yeah. I think there's something to this that uh, I think uh, is worth exploring a little bit. I don't know enough about the subject to, to say anything conclusive, but it's my understanding that Japanese, uh, the sort of the Japanese uh, outlook, uh, is, is, is different from the Western in this respect. So one of the reasons why I, I've been told, anyway, uh, that the Japanese are more open to robotics than we are in the West. In other words, they find it less creepy for an old person to be cared for by, ro- by robots than we do. We, we think that there's something that has been lost in the process. The thing that we're getting at right here is something real has been lost. But uh, it's my understanding that with at least the sort of the animism of, of the East, if, it, if, it, if something is animate, that, that there's some kind of uh, dynamic at work that um, is not just simulation, but actually kind of closer to the real than we normally in the West uh, recognize. Now, maybe I'm putting this, uh, you know, maybe I'm stating an untruth here, but this is what I've, I think I've heard uh, in, in terms of how sort of the Eastern outlook is, differs from the Western outlook in this respect. Interesting. Yeah, I know that there are, the Japanese have a long history of animes featuring robots and giant robots and things like that that are, yeah, they're like the Transformers. They're functionally sentient and alive and everything else. Yeah, it would be curious to 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 kind of think of, you know, the animism that, co- that kind of is behind a lot of that and carried over, just like old ancestor worship and things like that, how that view of reality um, infuses their interpretation of, of what we would consider very much inanimate in many ways. Um and yeah, that 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 is a, that's an interesting subject. I, I yeah, I may have to try to track something down on that. Yeah, now, this also brings up another distinction that he makes earlier, very early in the essay, um, about the term supernatural. And at this point, we're going to be getting to Tom Bombadil, Chris. So <laughs> brace yourself. Um, he he says that you know it's a mistake. It's, it's really a serious category error, if I may put it in my words, to argue that elves and uh, the other denizens of fairy are supernatural. Mm-hmm. He says they are actually preeminently natural creatures. Yeah. Uh, and unless you're using the word supernatural, uh, super as a prefix meaning uh, superlative, um, it's really a mistake to think of them that way. Yeah. And, and in contrast, this is why he, you know, he says initially fairy is really about magic. And he says later in the essay, he says, you know, I said that, but that's not really correct because magic pro- should properly be reserved for the, the craft of the magician 
who through technique seeks to impose his will to dominate either things or minds, beings in this world. So he sees magic as being the antithesis of what, you know, in its technical sense, as being the opposite of what fairy is about. Um, magic is all about technique and it's about domination, whereas fairy is about n- nature expressing itself in the highest possible way. So the elves are preeminently n- natural creatures. And it occurred to me that that's Bombadil. Yeah, yeah, I think yep. that's right. Yeah. Yep. Tom, Tom is uh, not, uh, you know, domineering, um, but he's the master. We've talked about that before. But I think that's why he, he so, I think, marvelously contrasts with Sar- uh, Saruman. Saruman very much is the magician. Whereas Tom is not a magician in that sense at all. Although Tom is remarkably uh, powerful, uh, his power isn't the power of domination. And, uh, you know, we've talked about this, like I said, uh, in the episode on Bombadil, when particularly when Goldberry uh, is asked by Frodo after she says Tom is the master and Frodo says, does, does that mean this, this land and everything in it belongs to him? And she says, oh, no. All the things in the land belong to themselves, uh, but Tom is the master. And then she goes on to say, "No one has ever caught him," which is, you know, I think intriguing because there's this connection that she makes between mastery and freedom that I think uh, is lost on us. It just strikes us as odd. I, th- I don't think many people spend much time thinking about Goldberry's statement there. Um, I think it's. Uh, it's mm-hmm. sad that they don't, but I think there's a whole lot there that I think Tolkien is getting at with regard to what it, what dominion actually means. You know, uh, if dominion is not domination, if those are different things, and we we confuse the two, we 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 think domination when we hear the word dominion. It's no wonder that pe- that people uh, are uneasy when Christians talk about taking dominion because they're assuming that what we're up to is what Saruman is up to. Yeah, and once again, the word master, as Tolkien would have been well aware, uh, it comes from the Latin magister, which refers to an instructor or teacher. Right. So Tom's role is to teach things in his sphere their proper their proper role, their proper responsibilities. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I was because I was oh, one last the point I was going to talk about is yeah, it's the the clear difference between the the notion of dominating as sort of enslaving or exploiting, um, or or um, rather than the kind of genuine understand Christian understanding of creation, for example, that creation to, to be a free creature um, is to be that which truthfully enacts itself um, as the creature that it is. <laughs> so to to have dominion is a way of, of as you mentioned, being a steward of that, cultivating that. Um, I, and, but I, I, I always think carving out that, that little place the right way where we have a part in in actually also developing things, making things techne, um, that doesn't lead to this kind of distorted sense of magic, but actually you can still build houses and make computers and stuff um, without it without it becoming magic or or a, the dangerous kind of technology. Um, um, and so that I think that place is where a lot of people don't know how to kind of tease out. The difference between um, that's why they would some of them will move towards getting away from technology altogether, or right. or completely indulging it. Yeah, I, I like that one of the things I was hoping we were going to get to is this connection. Again, think about his definition of magic. It is to kind of condense it. It is the imposition of your will over things or minds through technique. Now, technique, the word technique is connected to the word technology. 
Saruman, the ultimate magician in a lot of ways in this sense, Sauron too, I suppose. But Treebeard describes Saruman as having a mind of wheels and gears. In Tolkien's mind, there's a very close connection between technology and magic, because both of them are aimed at domination over, well, at the very least, things, over nature. And we've talked about this before in connection with the, the, um, the rise of science as a means of controlling the world, imposing our will on the world. This is very much the attitude that Tolkien is bringing into it. Which, you know, takes us back to Tom's question, you know, how do we na navigate these, these things? Because there is, uh, you know, a right, I think, uh, and a good use for technique. Um, you know, when we think mm -hmm. about uh, the way the elves, uh, the artifacts that they've made, um, sometimes are so subtle and beautiful that uh, other you know, creatures in Middle Earth refer to them as magical, but the elves themselves are puzzled by the, by the expression. You remember Galadriel, she's, you know, she says you, <clears throat> to speaking to Sam, this is elf magic if you want to take it that way, but I don't understand what you mean by that because you use the same word to, to say, yeah, for the deceits of the enemy and what we do. <laughs> They're different things entirely <laughs> in her mind. And, uh, and there seems to be a kind of harmony um, with sort of elf technology and the natural order that I think maybe uh, the elves learned the hard way. If you think about Fionor, for example, uh, and his great achievements and how those were, you know, the re you know resulted in the Cimmerils. And there's a point where uh, Gandalf in the Lord of the Rings even supposes that Fionor was the was responsible for the Palantir, you know, the seeing stones that the, the men of Numenor used to rule their, their realm. It was a kind of a gift to them that they had received from the, from, uh, well, an unexplained source, but the, this, this, but, but there, there is a kind of dark story in the elves own past with regard to tech technique, um, you know, and, uh, the desire to acquire, uh, knowledge, particularly with the Noldor, you know, that particular branch of the elf, you know, sort of family, you know, they were the ones who were the, the great masters of, of sort of, uh, you know, what we would call today technology. Um, and they have a kind of also an interesting relationship. The Noldor have an interesting relationship to the dwarves. The dwarves are uh, also, you know, you know, great, uh, you know, makers. And then when it comes to the, to even men, you know, there are, you know, the men of the West who are the greatest makers when it comes to, you know, men think about Orthanc, you know, the fact that when the ants attack it, they can't harm the actual artifact that was made by the men of the West, the tower itself, they were completely, uh, stymied by they had no power to, to harm it at all they just in fact that it, it's described as they just you know for all of their wanton you know, sort of destruction you know their their rage they could barely scratch it mm -hmm. so there are these things that have been made that are wondrous but at the same time are different from i guess uh, what we see Saruman up to, or maybe it's just a matter of degree. It's something to think about. No, no, it isn't. It isn't. I would argue, in light of what Tolkien has to say about elves being superlatively natural, that what Feanor's skill consisted of was taking something that was natural and developing it to its fullest possible extent so that all of the hidden abilities, all the hidden processes, all the hidden things it can do were revealed through Feanor's work. Um, you know, uh, Tolkien elsewhere says, you know, when he's talking about recovery, he, um, he says that in Graham, Graham was the sword of uh, Siegfried, um, the greatest of the Norse heroes. Uh, in the forging of Graham, cold iron was revealed. In the creation of Pegasus, horses were ennobled. 
You know, so when you're pulling it into this sort of uh, context of fairy, in this case, recovery, what you're seeing here is that Graham was a, quote, magical sword, but it was only magical because it brought out the full potential of what cold iron could be. Pegasus was a magical creature, but only because it was a heightened version of what a horse it was. You know, it, it, it ennobled the horse. So I, I think that that elven magic, what it does is it, in Tolkien's world, is it brings out what is natural to its maximum extent, to its maximum uh, ability. Just like you can take a lump of something that looks almost like coal and turn it into a multifaceted diamond that will glow in the light. So Feanor was able, the, the unimaginable mind and hand of Feanor, as Gandalf puts it, um, he is able to create gems that can capture and hold light in a way that a normal diamond can't. But that's because he's pulling out the full potential of the thing. And that, that I think... Unlo yeah. yeah, yeah I mean, un I think, unlike, say, Saruman. Yeah. And I, th I think that gets really at... I mean, I th into the territory of questions, I think, that start to push down into the relation of the particular, for example, person or, or uh, creature to that which is being developed. Um, and in some sense, I mean, think of, think of it uh, just the, in the Old and New Testament where you have, okay, the spirit endowment of certain people to build certain things, right? Certain kinds of craftsmanship. Um, there, would be, there would be a couple of purposes tied to that. One would be, of course, actualizing potential that is within the natural uh, reality, um, and, and, but also it would be, have something sanctified about it in that it didn't go it, into di directions it wasn't permitted, but also it was aimed as well as towards ultimate purposes in some sense, which, which things are created for. Let's think about the Tower of Babel, right? I mean, what's going on here? We have obviously, um, human beings taking nature's potential in building something and even something you know, aimed at a certain kind of transcendence, but because it's steeped in human pride, right, and it's grounded in a relationship to that material that is is problematic. The 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 product of it is problematic, right? It re receives a judgment and it has a consequence. It's the breakdown of language of all things um, and communication. Um, but then think of that that you know. God commissioning a people to be a body, to build a temple, of course, temples that can be destroyed, but ultimately is building a temple that won't. Um, so, so there is, there's a kind of rich depth to this question um, that I think, um, I mean, I think Tolkien illumines in the way in which certain kinds of creatures related to, to the natural um, and to creation um, are able to do things in harmony with it that don't go beyond the permissible, and others are so captivated by these things that they become enslaved to it and exploit others with it. And that does does go back to that question of the relation of of things like virtue to to the the creation itself. Yeah, I, um, similarly I think, you know, to I mean, like pride, for example. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, people who um, are dismissive of Tolkien because he's not dealing with the, with the modern world or the real world uh, are deaf to these things in Tolkien. He's actually dealing with pretty fundamental concerns and challenges that we as moderns face. Um, I think especially with, re with regard to the relationship between you know, what we would today call the environment and our technologies, you know, how, how these two things uh, kind of uh, relate to each other. And if there is a good that exists apart from our own designs, in other words, in the nature of things, then um, we are faced with some limitations. Uh, we're not permitted to do whatever we please. We're not we're not permitted to do what 
say Saruman would do, which is break things in order to se separate, you know, raw power from the given ends to which that power has been directed in the, in the, in the nature of things. And then, <clears throat> then the question of, you know, when we've been kind of, kind of getting at this, how, how do these two things relate to each other? We see, I think in, in the ants, something that didn't work, obviously the ants are now unable to relate to each other, the ants and the ant wives. So these two approach, you know, sort of this, the, you could say the pure approach in each direction gets further and further, you know, apart. Uh, and then we see something in the elves that is remarkable. And perhaps that's where we should go in terms of thinking about, you know, our own approach to this, this question. Uh, getting back to Bombadil though, Bombadil appears to me to have, uh, solved it as well, but maybe in a different way. Um, Bombadil has a garden. Um, he's, you know, he's in a, in a place, uh, where, uh, everything is tended in his, with regard to his house. And yet he's the master of the, of the, of the old forest, which is not something he spends a whole lot of time tending. <laughs> he spends his time, you know, you know, in it, but not with the idea of making it do what he wants. Yeah, it's worth noting that Tolkien was once asked about his political philosophy, and he said he was an anarchist. Right. And he was quick to add that he wasn't a bomb-throwing anarchist. But <laughs> um, I, th I, th I think in sort of modern American terms, Tolkien was probably closest to something like a libertarian, except a libertarian who understood liberty in its original sense, where there are natural and divine laws that you don't transgress. There is there is a positive good, an objective good that you would work toward, but you have complete freedom within that framework. So Bombadil tends his garden, but he lets the forest be the forest. The Shire has a mayor, but the mayor does nothing. He's a, it's a ceremonial <laughs> position. He has no real authority. Right. Um, you have, you know, the, the hobbits aren't anti-technology. They've got a, a water mill, a, you know, a mill that's that's water powered, but they're not going to put, or they shouldn't put in the coal powered mill because that, you know, that is a, you're not working with nature at that point. You're working against it. But even, even the Miller, um, you know, there's, a, there's a whole slew of things like this. Yeah, but if you remember, you know, even the Miller, Ted Sandyman, is uh, mm. somebody that that Sam uh, has, doesn't get along with very well, and uh, and the, and right. that the Miller is actually a, a character. I remember in the Scouring of the Shire, one of the guys who was uh, found the the new regime uh, seductive <laughs> when when Sharky right. comes to town. <laughs> Yeah, and you know what? If you're going to have a libertarian society, you've got to allow there to be jerks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, maybe, it, we should probably bring this in for a landing, as uh, as we as I like to say anyway. But because we're getting to that time, but <laughs> a couple of things just to think about, maybe, and get your get your thoughts here quick on uh, Glenn, uh, the relationship of uh, the uh, the king to this. So you know, we have. Uh, you know, Aragorn, who spent years as a ranger protecting the borders of the Shire without the, without the hobbits knowing that they were protected. And, the, you know, they, 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 and then when the, the Grey Company, remember, the rangers go south to war, it's not long before we, we see, you know, Saruman moved into town and uh, take over the place. So what, what, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, one of the complaints that, um, who was it? George R. R. Martin. Martin was a big fan of Tolkien. He's, he readily admits this. But he says, you know, it says Aragorn ruled as a good king for 100 years. It doesn't tell us how he ruled. <laughs> so he says, what was his tax policy? <laughs> you know, what did he do about the orcs after the battle at Morinon? 
you know, did he hunt him down? Was it a genocidal war? Did he try to convert him? What did he do? We're not told any of that. And I would argue that Tolkien would say all of that is beside the point. <laughs> okay. But there is no question that Tolkien recognized, you know, because he is a libertarian, yes, but a libertarian who recognizes that objective good and evil exists. There is no question that the good has to be protected against the evil. And so what you do find out is that one of his policies is nobody's allowed to mess with the Shire. Right. Okay. So, uh, you know, I, I think Tolkien was enough of a realist to recognize that there was a degree in which force is necessary to protect the weak. That's what the Rangers were doing. You know, that's what Aragorn's rules about the Shire after he came to the throne were about. We don't know much about the rest of it, but we do know at least that much. And I would suggest that the, what the definition of a good king is a king who, to Tolkien's mind, who allows people their liberty but protects them against what's evil. That's a that's a good <clears throat> that's a good place to end the show. We're we're at that time, and uh, those are some great thoughts, Glenn. So, as I mentioned when we started the show today, this particular episode is going to going to be coming out on the Monday before the Pacific North- Northwest tour begins. So, uh, hopefully, uh, you if you live here in the Pacific Northwest and you're listening to this right now. Uh, you'll be able to uh, ha- have an, you know, some time with us in person. We're going to be at a number of locations. And if you'd like to learn about where we'll be and when we'll be there and all that stuff, you can go to the, our, our Theology Pugcast website. Uh, if you just do a, you know, a Google and type in the Theology Pugcast, you'll get you know, one, you know, one of the options uh, will be the, our, our website. And there, if you go to the, our, our, our website, you'll see... Uh, on the menu that there is a is a sub uh, you know uh, there's a, a subcategory called the you know tour. If you click on that, you'll be taken to you know the entire itinerary for it. But if uh, just kind of give you a, a sense of what uh, will be happening in terms of the ballpark, uh, where we'll be and, and when we'll be there. So on Saturday the thirtieth and the thirty first, we're going to be in the in the Portland area. Uh, we're going to be uh, in Battleground, uh, Washington, and in uh, Vancouver, Washington, and we'll be down in uh, Oregon City, Oregon. And uh, so those are some locations we'll be. And then we'll be going up on the uh, 2nd and 3rd to the Seattle area, and we're going to be in uh, Bremerton, I think it is, uh, one night, and I think that's the 2nd. And then on the 3rd, we're going to be in Everett, and that's those are communities in the Seattle area. And then on the 4th and 5th, we'll be in Moscow. And uh, so uh, we'll be there on the 4th on the Cross Politics show. Uh, and then in the evening, we're going to be at the Newark Theater uh, there downtown for a live show. And then on the 5th, we're going to be actually uh, just participating in the NSA, the New St. Andrews Banquet, and Tom will be speaking at that banquet. But anyway, if you want to learn more about those, sh- those, those events, there are links that will take you to places to sign up and give you an opportunity to, you know, learn more about the particular, uh, you know, church or, uh, or entity that's sponsoring our time there. And uh, we'd love to see you. Anyway, uh, thank you for listening to the Theology Podcast. A lot of folks uh, listen to us on a regular basis. Uh, I just, look, you know, we, 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 we have a pretty good sense that probably between six to 9,000 people listen to every show. And so uh, that's a remarkable thing from our perspective. We, <laughs> we're very glad that you, you're part of the, uh, our, our listening audience. And uh, a number of people support us financially on a regular basis, and we're very glad for that, too. Uh, it helps us to take care of the, all the sundry costs that we incur just producing the show. So thanks a lot for that. Anyway, that's enough for me. Uh, anything else you guys want to say as we wrap up? Guess not. All right. All right. Bye bye. We'll hopefully see you next week up in the Pacific Northwest. See you soon. Yeah. <laughs> bye now. Bye.